Are you ready to study the word of the Lord? All right, first Shmuel. First Shmuel or first Samuel chapter 5. Say Shmuel. It's just funny. It's just fun to say. Shmuel, right? That's his name. First Samuel. It's clear that this is a difficult time in Israel's history. If you are here for the first time, we're in a study called the Books of Kingdoms. It's a study of First Samuel, and who knows where it'll go because the Books of Kingdoms actually, it consists of uh, several different books in the Old Testament, and so who knows how far we'll go. But we are in chapter 5, and uh, if you want to get caught up, you can access those on the app or on um, the internet at uh, ncchurchhome.com. Uh, but Israel is having a hard time. How many of you ever had a hard time? And how often is it your fault? Sometimes? Nobody wants to, nobody wants to admit it. Never. Always. Pastor, it's never my fault. You know, sometimes, how many have ever suffered the consequences of their own poor choices? Raise your hand. Yep. Yep. Even the young ones, I like that. It's like, yeah. We've all suffered the consequences of our poor decisions, and this is where Israel is right now. They are unable to um, decipher where they are as a nation. They're getting careless with the things of God, and they find themselves entangled in a war with the Philistines. Now, we learned last week that the Philistines were troublemakers. They're a seafaring, warring people. Now, according, to, uh, according to historians, they weren't just a warring people, but they were actually... Uh, technologically, an, an advanced people. They had had advancements in ironwork, and so their weapons, their swords, their shields, their, their, their armor, it was more advanced than Israel's. And so these weren't people that, one, they were ruthless, and they, had it, they were advanced technologically and militarily. You didn't just run out into battle against the Philistines. They were those people. They're ruthless in battle. You might die. Right? That, that was the Philistine army. And so uh, Israel had been successful against superior forces before this battle. But what they seem to forget here is that they were successful against superior forces in the past because God was fighting for them. That's why they were successful. Yet they go out against the Philistines and they don't even bring the ark with them. They're just like, we're going to go out and we're going to defeat them. And they don't, we're not even, we don't need to, even need to take God with us. Like their head is, they're not in the right head space here. <laughs> they go out against this superior force, and what happens? Time for a life lesson. Right? Time, time to learn something. God uses this opportunity to teach them how Yahweh has this reputation in the land. His, his reputation precedes him. Right When Israel gathers against the Philistines, right, the Philistines beat them. Initially, 4,000 men die in that initial battle. And then they're like, oh, we forgot God. Get God's box and bring it out like it's some kind of lucky charm. And they bring the ark out onto the battlefield. And there's this great roar of praise in the camp of the, Israel, uh, of the Israelites. And the Philistines are like, all right, they just lost 4,000 people. They should not be partying right now. Like, this is not normal. What happened? And so they look at what happened. They realize that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. And so the Philistines are like, we are in a lot of trouble because these are the gods. They use a plurality there, but we know it's one God, right? These are the gods that poured out all of the plagues, every plague on the Egyptians in the wilderness. And so they're terrified. We are in trouble. And they conclude within themselves, you would rather die now like men than be servants to the, to the Hebrews. So it says, they said, be, be men, O Philistines. Go out and fight and die like men. And so they go out into the battlefield uh, against Israel. The ark is there, and they fight the Philistines against uh, is, is the Israelites. And what happens? Israel's defeated again. Even though they had a great worship service the night before. Right? Israel's defeated now decisively. I mean, they lost initially 4,000 men, and now they've lost 30,000 men. Just a tragic defeat. Uh, we know at the end of chapter 4, the Philistines have taken the ark of the Lord, right? And news gets back to, uh, gets back to Eli, who's sitting in a chair along the way. He's concerned for the ark of the Lord. Uh, one of the messengers leave the battlefield, and they come in, and Eli reach, uh, met, the news reaches Eli that his sons have died, 
according to the prophecy of the Lord. He knew that was coming. But that didn't even concern him as much as the ark of the Lord had been taken. That Israel had fleed. They have, flo- they have, they have left the battlefield before the Philistines. And the ark of the Lord has been taken. So Eli, in response, he's shocked. Right? He falls back off his stool or off his chair, break his, breaks his neck. And that's where we find ourselves, the beginning of chapter 5. Right? And so great calamity, great devastation has come to the people of God. And um, here we are in chapter 5. And so let's, let's get, we're just going to read through the whole chapter because we're going to cover it today. And then we're going to pray and then we're going to jump in. It says, When the Philistines captured the ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And so they took, the, they took Dagon and they put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. They sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a great panic, a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of the God to Ekron, But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent, therefore, and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place, that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us today. uh, This is an incredible story of your power, uh, God, of your sovereignty. And we just ask, Lord, that you'd help us to to learn uh, from this today. We know that every time we open your word, you have something to teach us. And so, God, I pray that our lives would be shaped by your word, by your spirit today, so that when we leave this place, we'd look a little bit more like the Savior, like Jesus. And we did when we arrived, all for the glory of the Father. In the precious name of Jesus, we all said, Amen. Amen. The point of today is simple. It is this. There is no God greater than Yahweh. Can we say that together? There is no God greater than Yahweh. There's no God greater than our God. Amen? Let's remember how Israel is feeling at this moment in history. They feel the glory of God had departed from Israel since the Ark of the Lord has been taken. We looked at this last week. The glory of the Lord and the Ark of the Covenant was kind of one and the same, right? The the presence of God hovered above the Ark, right? He sat between the cherubim on the mercy seat, which is on top of the ark. And so where the ark went, the presence of the Lord went. And so when the Philistines, when the Philistines take the ark, Israel is, they begin to despair because they believe that because the ark is gone, the glory of the Lord has departed from Israel. Can you imagine? <coughs> Up until this point in Israel's history, the ark was always with Israel. It was always in Israel's possession. The ark went before Israel into battles. It marched before them in the wilderness. They see it cross over Jordan first, 
and then you see it marching around the walls of Jericho with the people. Like the ark always went into battle with the people of God. Can you imagine the despair now that the ark is gone? The hopelessness. God has abandoned us. God, God is gone. You know, as an aside this morning as we get going, whenever we, we find ourselves in difficult situations, whether it's just life, how many know that life is sometimes hard and has nothing to do with what God wants to perform in your life and what the enemy wants to do? Like, life is hard. How many have noticed that? Sometimes we're just experiencing life. And then sometimes we're suffering the consequences of our poor choices. And sometimes the Lord brings discipline in, into our lives. How many know that the Lord brings discipline into our lives? The Bible tells us that he disciplines those he what? Loves. He's a good father. And so, but sometimes so God, God brings discipline, we suffer consequences, and then life is just tough sometimes. But when we get into those moments, how many know we're often, maybe you've experienced this, we're often tempted to despair. I've heard people uh, throughout the years come to me and say, Pastor, I just feel like God's not there. I don't know why this is happening to me. Has God left me? Maybe it was because there was some failure in their life or they, you know, they, they were not walking in the faith, right? Whatever it is, whatever they're going through, there's this temptation to think God has abandoned me and God has left me. Church, can I encourage you this morning? It might be tough right now. But if, if you are the Lord's, it doesn't matter how dark it seems. God has not abandoned you. And God has not left you. We see his promise in, in Hebrews that he will not leave us or forsake us. Right? If you are not in the Lord this morning, you need to be in the Lord. Like you need to seriously consider the faith choices you're making in your life. I know it's, it's, now this is going to be very controversial. But there is only one way to heaven, friend. Only one way. Like the world says that there are many gods, there are many ways to, to, to the afterlife. Oh, there are a lot of roads to the afterlife, but maybe not the afterlife you want. That's why it says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the way that leads to life. There's only one way. It doesn't matter what the world says. One way, one truth, one life. His name is Jesus. That's the only way. And so, yes, the world is right in this, that there all roads lead to the afterlife. But which afterlife do you want? There's one of two choices. You can spend eternity with the Savior in heaven in glory, or you can spend eternity separated from Him in hell. That's your choice. That's the afterlife. Now, I've, had, I've heard uh, uh, <coughs> preachers in the past describe it this way. Like, we are all on a train, and it is bound for a cliff, and there's only one way off this ride. His name is Jesus. You either take the, you either take the escape from this world that is perishing, you either take the escape and live forever, or you go off the cliff in the train with everybody else, and you suffer, and you perish like everybody else. It's your choice. And sometimes we, we work really hard to try to convince somebody to make the right choice. First of all, it's not our, our job to convince anybody to make the right choice. That's their choice to make. But friends, I know I, I made the choice to follow Christ. And it was the best choice I ever made. He's changed my life. How about you? I wouldn't want to be going through this life without Jesus. I wouldn't. So... Life is hard, consequences, discipline, but God has not abandoned you. And so if you're in a difficult situation right now, be encouraged. The Lord is with you. I, I, get, I get your stories. I get a lot of stories, church. I know a lot of you are dealing with some pretty difficult stuff. Be encouraged. The Lord is with you. This passage shows us that God is in control the whole time. right? God is never out of control. The Philistines didn't get one over on him. They didn't, they didn't get, and they're about to learn a valuable lesson. They're about to learn what it means to be, as Jonathan Edwards says, sinners in the hand of an angry God. They're about to learn a valuable lesson, that they didn't win anything, that Jehovah was in control the whole time. And uh, it's a valuable lesson indeed. They don't learn much from it, though. 
unfortunately, sadly. Uh, but let's dive back into it. Verse 1, it says, When the Philistines captured the ark, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. The Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Now, let's look at Dagon for a minute. Dagon was an interesting character, a false god of the Philistines. Uh, historians believe uh, that he was kind of a god of gods. He was superior to other false gods, but... Um, let's get a look at him here. Here's a little depiction. I'll go ahead and put him back up there. Impressive fellow. He was uh, uh, half, half fish, half man. Yes, he was a merman. <laughs> a, mer, a merman, yes. Can you imagine this fish god uh, sitting high on his throne as the ark of the Lord, small by comparison, is set beside him? No doubt it was placed there as an offering for the victory that Dagon had, had provided for them over Jehovah. All right, they brought it to their God. Can you imagine the celebration as the armies of the Philistines walk proudly into the temple of Dagon and they place the spoils of their victory at the feet of their God? The processionals, the feasting, the debauchery, the music, the dancing, the chanting, no doubt. Dagon has slain Jehovah. Now think about it for a minute. These were the soldiers that at the end, the middle end of, of chapter 4, were say, they said, we're going out there to die. Die like men. You'd rather die like men than serve the Hebrews as, as they have served you. And now, they have been victorious. Can you imagine the celebration? The rejoicing on the streets of Ashdod as they come into the temple of Dagon. What's striking here is uh, we, get, we kind of get the 30,000 foot view, like we get to see the whole picture. The Philistines have no idea what's headed for them. They have no idea. They're out enjoying the beach. They can't see the monsoon on the horizon. They can't see what's coming their way. They don't perceive the danger that they're in. They have brought the ark of the living God and they have put it next to their merman. I have no idea. Man, listen, church, in many respects, the world has no idea. And I, this, this encourages me so much because we can often look at the world and say, Lord, why is darkness winning? Why is evil winning? Let us be reminded that evil and darkness are not winning anything. Evil and darkness are winning today like Dagon won after the battle at Ebenezer. God has not slid off his throne. Someone hasn't picked him up and put someone else there on the seat of power of the universe. There's no other creator. God is in control. Can you say God is in control this morning? Man. God is in control. So the Philistines bring... The ark of the Lord, and they place it next to their God with great celebration, great shouting, great rejoicing. And they partied all night. Verse 3, they woke up in the morning to a surprise. Look what it says. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon was fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon, and they put him back in his place. How embarrassing. How, embar how embarrassing that you, you have just brought the spoils of war and placed them at the feet of your God, and now you're just like, hey guys, can you help me? I don't know, he fell over. I don't know what happened, right? Did they party too hard? Did they party too hard? Did somebody knock Dagon over? Did he need a nap? Like, can you imagine how embarrassing that would have been? We gotta prop Dagon back up. Now what's surprising here is We've all acknowledged here together because we are a church full of imperfect people. People can be, be, be thick-headed, right? Even us, we can be thick-headed. You know, we often criticize the, the, the characters we see in Scripture, the people of God in particular, and we say, oh, how could they have been so thick? Church. How many were thick-headed this week? Yes. This week! Now, sometimes I wonder if it happens 
more to me than to others. You ever feel that way? Not that it happens to me, but it happens to you. He's like, Lord, am I, am I occupying a lot of your time here, Lord? Because, because I struggle a lot, as I know you do as well. But I, they're thick. They're, they're thick-headed, right? They don't think much of the fact that they have to put their God back in his place. That they have to prop him back up. And so they prop up their, their merman, and they put him back on his pedestal, and they go about their business. Like nothing just happened. And they get up the next morning to another surprise. This one's a little different. Verse 4, it says, And when they rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Only the trunk. Now, uh, many believe that when it says the trunk of Dagon, it's talking about the fish part of Dagon. Right? That the top, the head, his arms, this had been cut off, but that just his fish part <laughs> was left. Now picture this. The Ark of the Lord stands in its place while Dagon lay prostrate before it. Now the, sign the significance of the head and the hands, you see this out throughout Scripture, um, and it, it really remains consistent. The head... It represents, it's, it's the seat of wisdom. It's where strategy is formed, logic. It's where wisdom flows, right? The head represents wisdom, and the hand's instrument of, instruments of action. You see when the right arm of the Lord is referenced, it speaks of strength and power. And so what has God done right here? He has rendered this false merman God witless and powerless in his presence. By this action against the God of the Philistines, God demonstrates very valuable, he, he provides very valuable insight for them. The Philistines did not win anything. That the only, the only reason they were allowed to succeed against God's people is because God himself allowed it. It wasn't their military uh, superiority, it wasn't their technological advances. What they're about to learn is it doesn't matter what you have. If God fights against you, you're done. But God has allowed this victory against his people. God has allowed it. They have not won anything. This false god, Dagon, he didn't provide a victory to them. Je Jehovah alone had allowed this victory. And now... They have invited him into their house to teach them. God's in, again, church, don't despair. Don't despair. God is never not in control. He's always up to something. You might go in for breathing problems, and God reveals the reason you're really there. We need to deal with this, Cheryl. God's always up to something. He's always working things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, what is surprising is what happens next. This is typical. Typical human response. Verse 5, it says, This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the, thre the threshold of Dagon and ask God to this day. So what do they do? They, they see this action against them by the true God. And what do they do? They just form a ritual around the ground where all their God's parts fell. This is where the head of Dagon laid. And this is where his hands are. We can't step there. We just have to, that's holy. Because the hands and the head of Dagon fell here. Right? That's what they do. Instead of going, whoa, true God. They go, oh, we don't want to step where Dagon's hands landed after the true God cut them off. Isn't it amazing that they could see, they could see this demonst great demonstration of power and still remain unstirred and still remain unswayed by it? And these priests have seen their God thrown down twice now. 
before the true God. You, you wonder, it's not written here in scripture, but I have to wonder. It's like, did they even think maybe one of them consider we might be on the wrong side of things here? Like anyone, did anyone consider the possibility that they were not serving the right God? That they were certainly serving an inferior deity. But there's no indication that they ever, any one of them came to that conclusion. It was clear. It's clear that Yahweh was superior. Why wouldn't they abandon Dagon to follow the living God? It's an interesting question to me. And then I realized, how many times has God revealed himself to me and still I go the way of faithlessness? Go the way of doubt. Right? God has revealed himself to the... And some, you know, people struggle this way today. Why don't people, regardless of the, mount, the mountains of evidence that there's a living God, why don't people choose to serve the living God? Probably the same reason the Philistines. Number one, rarely do people ever like to change. And so, think about it. How, mo how monumental this was for the priests of Dagon. Right? If they were to, to leave Dagon and serve the living God, their whole culture would have had to change. Everything would have had to change. And so rather than follow the living God, they just, they just made the ground where the hands and head of their God fell they made that holy. That was their decision. Someone came up to me this morning after, uh, after the service and said, you know, Pastor, I think there's something in addition to a person not wanting to change. I think it's also pride. Right? Because you look at, he was dead on, too. I was like, why didn't I think of that? It had, there was a level of pride that was demonstrated here because can you imagine the priest of Dagon going to the city of Ashdod, we've been wrong the whole time. Can you imagine the President of the United States? <laughs> but can you imagine what that would do? It's the one thing they should do. Can you imagine any politician just going, we've been wrong this whole time? <laughs> We'd be like... Somebody said it out loud. Right? Absolutely. Can you imagine? So there's this, level, there's this level of pride that's involved here. They're like, we can't abandon Dagon. Can you imagine acknowledging that we're wrong? And so they don't. They're, they're confronted with the power of the real God, yet they remain in service to this false God. People struggle this way these days, right? You, you can look all around you. Look at the world around you. It doesn't matter how many times you say the fact that there's order in the world reveals the reality that there is a designer, that there's a creator. It doesn't matter how many times you say that. People still say, well, I just, it makes more sense to me that we exploded out of nothing billions of years ago. Just poof, here we are. That out of the chaos of the universe, somehow everything has come into order. It doesn't matter how many times you point out the obvious reality that there is design here, that there must be a designer. It doesn't matter how many times you say it, they don't believe. It doesn't matter. It's like me saying, you see that picture up there? There was no designer. It just evolved spontaneously <laughs> over billions of years. That's literally what the Word wants us to believe. The fact that you can see design means it's a designer. But no, it doesn't matter how many times you say it. That this, is, this is the response that you get often from the world, and it really hasn't changed. People, people struggle the same way today. They don't want to change. They don't want to change. And I would say, church, this is probably one of the greatest sins of the postmodern church. We have presented a gospel that doesn't demand change. The American church has presented a gospel that doesn't demand change. Can I offer this to you this morning? 
If you believe in Christ and you have given your life to Him, your life must change. Christ gave everything. He suffered for us. And here we are. Just take Jesus. You don't have to change nothing. Just add Jesus to your life and everything's going to get better. How dare we say, no, if you come to Christ, you must change your life. And by the way, things might actually get worse. Welcome to the kingdom. Right, because the, the, the guy that founded the church, yeah, he was tortured and abused and killed for the sake of his church. Not dead, he rose from the dead. But if they did it to Christ, who is our master, how can we expect any less than his servants? And so the, 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 the American church has presented this gospel that costs us nothing. Yes, salvation is a free gift, but it's going to cost you everything. It's an exchange. You have to exchange the old you for the new you in Christ. Behold, I am a new creature in Christ. He has made all things new. And so we have presented a gospel that costs people nothing. And we're going to answer for it one day, church. When we come to Christ... Our lives change. And there's, there's a work that happens in us simply because God's Spirit is now in us and He's conforming us into the image of His Son. And so there is this work that happens automatically, but there is this partnership with the Holy Spirit that must take place. As we study the Word of God, as we apply the Word of God, our lives must change. Doesn't matter what the world says, doesn't matter what the culture says. Doesn't matter what's popular, what's not popular. What has God said? And then go out and be pr people of principle. Go out and act according to what He has said. Those of you who are serving in public office, commissioners, council members, state representatives, like you have to go into, into office and act according to the Word of God. Stand on principle. And that's expected of all of us, church. Because we're different. This isn't, this isn't, oh, just say, right, just say a magic prayer. And then lollipops and rainbows and unicorns and everything's just going to be happy all the time. There was that, a tricky verse in scripture where Jesus says that we will be persecuted for his name's sake and all. Hello? <coughs> oh, Lord, help us to get back on track. Forgive us for watering the gospel down and doing our own thing. You can't, you can't just work to make the gospel attractive to the world. The world thinks the gospel's foolishness, church. Preach it like it's meant to be preached. Speak it like it's meant to be speak. Live it like it's meant to be lived. Let God work in the hearts of people around you. Remain consistent. Stay true to the word. Let God do the rest. Okay, let's get back on track. <laughs> Yahweh. God help us to honor you. Yahweh will not be worshipped alongside Dagon. That's obvious. When the true and living God, and this is, this is a great picture. I don't want to miss this. You know, when, God, when the ark of the Lord goes into the house of Dagon, what happens? The false god has to bow. Do you realize that when God enters the temple of your heart, the other things that you've worshipped have to bow? Like when the, when the eternal God enters this temple, that what is in your heart must bow to the true king? That when we come together in this place and he fills this place, we bow and worship. That's what worship is. It's bringing low. It's, it's bowing before. It's it's. Offering all power and glory to the one who, the only one who's worthy of it. What happens when you come in, into the presence of true power? Right? We bow. Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, first commandment. Given, you shall, not have, you shall have no other gods before me. Everything has to bow. As Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, he makes 
this declaration. He speaks the word back to Satan. He says in Luke chapter 4, verse 8, he says, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. God doesn't share this space with anyone else. Everything in our life must bow before the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Everything must come low. He brought low, bowed before him. Everything in your life. When you ask God to enter the temple of your heart, the other things you worship with your time, your resource, your affection, it must bow. He must become the priority. This is a fundamental truth to the Christian faith. I will give all that I am for all that he is. I am a new creation in Christ. My life is no longer my own. I've been bought with a price. What shocks us about the blindness of the priests of Dagon as they witness the power of God and go on worshiping their powers, powerless, witless God, it, this th same thing plays out in the lives of many people these days. They see God, He's there, but they turn and they walk away. They don't want to let go of what it is that binds them. Verse 6, the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and, and He terrified and afflicted them with tumors both Ashdod and its territory. Now, historians differ on what these tumors were. Some believe it had something to do with the bubonic plague, which they relate to the, the, the rats later in the story when they're sending the ark back finally. Like, get it out of here, right? That will eventually happen. They send an offering of rats, and, and they make idols out of the tumors, which is even funnier once you realize what it might have been. But they send it, So some people say... Some people say they had some connection to bubonic plague because of the rats. Others say uh, because of the language that it was something a bit more humiliating. Uh, if you look at this term tumor, it's ophel, and it means to mound or to swell, to say to swell. And this is why that's kind of funny. The biblical usage for this word is one of two things, tumors, if you look at the King James Version, it's, it actually says, it says, emrods. Emrods is the way it's interpreted in the King James. Emrods, say that. Say, start saying it fast. Emrods. Oh. Right? And so some people say it, it could be associated with bubonic plague, these tumors, this swelling in the body. Some say it might very well have been a like, serious hemorrhoid issue. Well, tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. I was listening to Pastor Gary, Gary Hamrick, and he said, the Lord reminded them that he was the true and living God every time they sat down. <laughs> Great reminder of who the true living God is. And so we don't know for sure, but there is a potential there. that um, So God, God comes into the camp, he knocks over their God, he cuts off their head and their hands, and then he smites the Philistine men, young and old. Ladies, I don't know how they, the ladies got out of it, but he strikes the men, it says, both young and old, with potential, like, God-sized hemorrhoids. <laughs> Verse 7, it says, And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon, our God. Right now... Listen to them. They're acknowledging that the God of Israel is superior. Get the ark of the God of Israel. They don't, say the, they don't say God. They say this other God, the God of Israel. Right? They're acknowledging that he's superior, yet they don't turn. They will not bow before him. They say, get God, get the God of Israel out of our town. He's being mean to us, and he's picking on our God. Our merman. He's picking on our merman. <laughs> wow. Verse 8. I love the, 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 mind, the strategic minds that these guys have, too. Verse 8, it says, So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of, of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. And so they brought the ark of God, the God of Israel, there. They brought the God, the God of Israel to Gath. Why? This is their strategy. The Lord's hand is heavy on us. 
and he smote us and he's making our life miserable. What are we going to do? I don't know. Get him, out of, get him out of here. Where are we going to send him? I don't know. Send him to another Philistine territory? And they do this over and over and over again. Send him to our neighbors. Oh, the hand of the Lord is heavy on Berwick. Let's get him out of here. Where do we send him? I don't know. Uh, another territory in Columbia County. Send him to Bloomsburg. Right? And then Bloomsburg starts complaining. I don't know. Send him to Catawissa. Like, this is their strategy. Never does it dawn on them until they've suffered a while. Well, let's just send the ark back. <coughs> they, they transfer it from Philistine territory to Philistine territory. Brilliant. Brilliant. You know what? I'm being hard on them. I think God was orchestrating this whole thing. He's like, you have taken, you, you had no power over my people. I'm working with them. And now you're going to learn a valuable lesson. And guess what? You're going to lose your minds a bit. And I'm going to have you send my ark around to all your towns so I can judge them the same way. Because God's like that. Oh, God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. God's in control. Even when things seem dark, things seem evil, God's up to something. He's in the background working. You can't always see him. You can't always feel him. You can't always hear him, but he's there. How do I know he's there? Because he said he's there. And I believe this. All of it. Not just parts. All of it. And he said he's there. Praise God. So as advanced as the Philistines were, they weren't too bright. <coughs> Instead of sending the ark back, they move it from Philistine territory territory to Philistine territory. Look at verse 9. It says, but after they had brought it out, after they had brought it around to Gath, poor Gath, right? After they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very, a very great panic, and he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of the god to Ekron. Send it to Catawissa. <laughs> Right? They send, it, they send the, the ark of the, the God of Israel to Ekron, but as soon as... Folks at Catawissa were smart. As soon as... Look at it. It says, it says they have, as soon as the ark gets to Ekron, the people cried out, Yo! Not here. They said, They have brought around to us the, God, the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent, therefore, and gathered together all the smart guys again. The ones that came up with the plan to send it to Philistine. Let's bring all those smart guys together again. They sent, therefore, and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place that it may not kill us and our people. Again, acknowledging the superiority of the God of Israel. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with, yes, tumors. And the cry, I believe it, the cry of the city went up to heaven. What we're going to see in the beginning of the next chapter is this went on for seven months. They passed the ark around and, and each took turns suffering where they finally got it. Now the Philistines, they got one night of partying before they began this process of learning a very valuable lesson. What's that lesson? There is no God greater than Yahweh. No God greater. You know, in closing, I want to point out something that dawned on me as I was preparing for this morning. And that is God is teaching this lesson, this same lesson, to both sides of the equation. The Philistines aren't the only ones that are learning the lesson that there is no God greater than Yahweh. The Israelites are learning it as well. Just in their own way. And all at the same time. Right? On, on one side you have Israel learning through the pain and despair of a tragic loss that they suffered on the battlefield, 34,000 men, their priests are dead, the ark of the Lord is gone. And so they're coming to the conclusion in their hearts that there is no God greater than Yahweh. 
And then on the other side of the pond, you have the Philistines who are learning this same lesson through the humiliation of their God and the humiliation and pain in their own bodies. There is no God greater than Yahweh, period. He's in control. He's always up to something. And he wrote this story, church, and a conclusion is coming. An end of the story will come. How valuable it is. You know, this is, this is an intense story, but you know what never ceases to amaze me? As I, we've looked through 1 Samuel, we're only five chapters in. Man, we've learned a lot. What dawns on me every single time is the, the patience of God. And I, I, I look at this story and I say, I'm reminded of va a valuable lesson. I'm reminded of the reality that we are blessed to have received the grace and mercy of God. That he has redeemed our wicked hearts and made us his own. Church, when you, look at, when you look at stories like this and you realize what you perceived because Christ endured the wrath of God on our behalf. Uh, it doesn't matter how intense I can say that, we don't get it. We don't. There's no way to wrap our minds around a God who would do something like we read today. All this power, he's able to maneuver and shape and order and orchestrate everything that he wants to take place. It happens according to the purpose and the counsel of his will that this same God would redeem us from our sins. That he would take that fury and that judgment, and that he would pour it out on the body of his son for you and for me is just amazing, church. What words, what words do you use? What words do you use to communicate how awesome that is? There are no words. That that God would put on flesh? That God, that wrathful and terrible and powerful God would come down and he would put on flesh and he would die at the hands of awful people. And while he's suffering, he would look at them and say, I forgive you. Church, we don't even get it. Absolutely amazing what we've received. That he has taken my wicked heart and he has made me his own. Church, How valuable it is for us to be reminded of this this morning. How valuable it is for us to remember that our great God, this great God who has given himself for us, has redeemed our wicked hearts and made us his own, that this great God will not share our hearts with another. That he is worthy. He is worthy of praise and he's worthy of a life of worship. That our lives must be lived in reverent worship to Him. That you and I are that you and I are engaged in this painful process of learning to say no to ourselves and yes to Him over and over and over again. Is that not easy for anybody else? Saying no to yourself is hard. So I think this. Stories like this are so valuable to us because they, at least, they help us to some degree to say no a little easier. It's, Rick, no. 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 And then you have this dialogue with yourself. But why no, Rick? Rick, no. But why no, Rick? Because, because God said no or God said yes. God said stay, or God said go. That's why. Total surrender, church. Total surrender. It's what God expects. And what it's what he's worthy of. What an amazing God we serve. Amen? Absolutely amazing God. Next week, we get to watch the Philistines cry uncle. They finally cry uncle. And again, it's like seven months of this. Pass them around. You take, you have a turn. Enjoy those emeralds. 
Would you stand with me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <gasps> Heavenly Father, before we pray, can I have the elders and, and any wives that are available come forward and pastors and the church leadership are up front every week to pray with you. In particular, I would invite you that if you have not given your life to God, that today is the day of salvation, that you don't want to leave you don't want to go out there without knowing where you're going to spend eternity. Narrow is the way, church. And I know this, and you know this, that you are not promised an exit out of this building. Not promised. I was just talking about to someone this week where his elderly wife was backing out of the driveway, and before she gets to the end of the driveway, her heart stops. The car coasts, life is completely different. You just don't know. You just don't know. Get right with God. You don't have to understand it all. You have to have a desire to want to understand it. You have to be willing to surrender. It's not to ask Jesus into my life and all things are going to get easy. It's not going to happen that way. I promise you, you ask Jesus into your life, your, your eternity is secure. You surrender your life to him. Your eternity is secure. But life won't be easy. But I'll tell you what. Regardless of the fact that life is not easy, <coughs> life is so much better with him. So much better with him. I've watched people go through suffering both with him and without him. And I'll tell you, church, you don't want to go through difficulty without him. I've been in this a long time now. I can't believe I'm doing the math. It's like 23 years. I've seen a lot of folks go through hard times. I've experienced hard times myself. I'd much rather do that with Jesus. I don't know how people make it through this life without him. So if you're here in this place and you have not surrendered your life to God, I invite you to do that as we pray this morning to believe in your heart. And then as we're dismissed, I would encourage you to come forward and speak with the elders uh, or their wives and just let them know that you gave your life to the Lord so they can minister to you. They can pray with you and answer questions you might have. They can connect you with one of the pastors. Uh, we take this very seriously, church. Life is so short and eternity is so long. If you want to spend eternity with Jesus, I assure you. So let's pray and believe together. Heavenly Father, Help us this morning. Father, help our unbelief. Father, your disciples say that to you. Lord, help our unbelief. And they're there with you, Jesus. And so, Father, sometimes we go through seasons of doubt and faithlessness, but we ask, Father, that you'd help our unbelief. Help us. Father, for those who are here in this place this morning and they have not committed their lives to you, Father, we pray together this morning and we believe together. Father, you said, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Believe what? Oh, that Jesus was who he said he was, that he did what he said he did. He came and he died. He was all God. He was all man. He died on a cross for our sins. He rose again on the third day. He is at this very moment at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Believe it. Believe he is the only way to eternal life. He is the only way into glory. So, Father, we just we pause in this place. And for those of us who have already trusted in you, Lord, we're just so thankful to know that we are in Christ this morning and that we are heaven-bound because of what Christ has done. And for those who are just now believing for the first time, Father, we rejoice with them because their, their eternity is secure in you. And so we believe together. And we rejoice together as the family of God. Father, help us. This life isn't getting any easier. The world isn't getting any saner. But Father, you are not weak. You are strong and you are powerful. And we need fear no one or no thing. But nothing in this world can shake us because we are standing on the rock that is higher than we are. God, thank you for lifting us up out of darkness and transferring us into the kingdom of your beloved Son. You've 
brought us out of darkness, transferred us into the light. And we, would, we just rejoice in you, Father. God, no matter what this world has for us, no matter what's waiting, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and beyond, no matter what's waiting for us, Father, we know that you are with us and we can face any obstacle because you are with us. God, we praise you and we give you all the honor and the glory. It's yours, Lord. We praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people say, God is good to us.